So now we're moving on to Genesis 2 and 3. In one sense, this is, of course, more controversial. Um, age of the Earth is a big issue for lots of people, and it's a serious issue that we need to address. But human origins um, really tops the charts uh, for the issues that need to be dealt with. So let's try to make some sense of this. Again, we're going to be focusing in on what the biblical claims are. That's what we want to try to understand. Again, my position is if I'm convinced the Bible claims it, then that's what I stand by. And if that means taking some flack or standing against a consensus, so be it. Uh, but I want to make sure that I understand the biblical claim. You know, a good rule of thumb is don't go dying on hills that you don't need to die on. All right? Just, just a thought. Um, so we want to make sure that we know what, what the territory looks like here. So uh, our first stop is to think about what is the relationship between Genesis 2, the Adam and Eve story, and the seven-day account that we have in Genesis 1. Now, again, already you might be kind of scrunching up your, your eyebrows and saying, well, I thought that was rather obvious. And see, that's the problem with lots of this. We tend to think that the answers are obvious and we've never asked the questions. We usually imagine that chapter 2 is giving us a recapitulation of day 6. That is giving us a little more detail about what's going on on day 6. But, of course, we've recognized that there are some problems with that. Now, first of all, Genesis 2 seems to have a changed order of things. And so we say, wow, um, how we've got to reconcile these somehow. So that's a little bit of a difficulty. Another difficulty, especially for those who believe that there are 24-hour days, is how do you fit all of this in? I mean, it's uh, God forming uh, Adam, and then uh, we have the planting of the garden. No, that came first, yeah, then... Uh, forming Adam, we've got the naming of the animals, the decision that it's not good for him to be alone, you know? It took him exactly three minutes and 22 seconds to feel lonely. And, um, you know, that then all naming the animals, oh my goodness, uh, wow. And where do we fit all of this in? And then Eve comes along and, I mean, just, there's, there's an awful lot to fit in if you think that there are 24 hour days. So, uh, the point is then that we need to ask the question, what is the relationship, rather than assume the answer. Now, the first place I go then is that important transitionary verse in Genesis 2-4. This is the account, the Hebrew word is toledot, of the heavens and the earth. In some translations, it's translated the generations or something of that sort. Now, we're fortunate because this transitionary phrase occurs 11 times in the book of Genesis. It is a structural element in Genesis that transitions from one segment to the other segment. So if we're going to understand what's the relationship to Genesis 2, which comes after that transitionary phrase, to Genesis 1, which comes before the transitionary phrase, we ought to take a look at the other 10 occurrences and see what the typical relationship is between what is before and after understand the strategy, okay? So, we take a look at the other 10, and here's the list of them. Uh, and we start looking at the relationship. In many of the cases, as you can see, the relationship is a sequel. That is that you have one account, and then you've got this transitionary introduction, and then a sequel, sometimes right after the last account, sometimes a good deal of time later. But it's a sequel. Other times, you can see a couple of them are recursive. What I mean by recursive is that, uh, for instance, it tells Ishmael's story through a genealogy. And then it comes back after the Toledot, after the transitionary formula, and talks about Isaac. Okay, that's not a sequel, because it's not like Isaac comes after that Ishmael genealogy. So it's not a sequel but it's likewise not recapitulation. That is, this is not just another way to tell the Ishmael story. It's a different story. It's just one that's happening at the same time. Okay, that's what I call recursion. All right? You can see that all of them are either sequel or recursive. None of them are recapitulative. Now, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be recapitulation. It just means that's not what it usually is. 
And therefore, that ought to lead us to wonder, is it possible that Genesis 2 is either a sequel or a recursive, instead of just assuming that it's a recapitulation of day six? Okay, I know I'm doing complex methodology here, but I hope you're following uh, how this works. Okay, so none of these are recapitulative, so that is not impossible, but it might be our last choice. If it's a sequel, if Genesis 2 is a sequel, that would mean that the people in Genesis 1 are not necessarily Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 doesn't mention Adam and Eve. Let us make people, humanity, in our own image. And let's make them male and female. It doesn't say there are only two. It doesn't mention Adam and Eve. And you're saying, huh, really? Really? It doesn't? Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> we usually assume it, right? But it doesn't mention them. And maybe Adam and Eve are among a larger group. Maybe Adam and Eve are the only two. That's possible also. Maybe it's a larger group and Adam and Eve come later. There are options on the table. And I'm not talking about scientific options. I'm talking about options in the text itself. So we have to consider the merits of each case that can be presented. We're going to make a decision based on evidence. Certainly, one of the advantages would be that the second account doesn't need to fit into day six. That's an advantage. But one of the disadvantages are, well, then, if Adam and Eve aren't the people in day six, or not the only people, I mean, in day six, well, then why single them out here? What's their significance? Well, we can address that. We never asked it before, but now we can. It would certainly also solve some problems that we have if Adam and Eve are not connected to that first group, or not the only ones. What I mean by that is, there are indications in the biblical text that there are other people around. I'm sure you've encountered them. Genesis chapter 4. Cain takes a wife. Huh. Never liked the sister option. <laughs> God drives Cain away. And Cain says, now anybody who finds me is going to kill me. Mom, cut it out, Dad! <laughs> what do you think? Cain builds a city. You can't build a city for yourself. If you're the only one living there, it's not a city. There are indications. Now again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm having some fun with this, but the, the people do have explanations that they try to offer. Adam and Eve are living a long time, they're having lots of kids, and they're having lots of kids, and they're having lots of, you know, they, they can build scenarios. But you have to speculate all of that, because the text doesn't say it. And if you have to speculate it, well, let's look at what other things we speculate. What are the other possibilities? How do they suit the evidence? This is textual analysis. This is what I do. Now, my proposal is that Adam and Eve are presented as having some archetypal functions. Now, I have to explain this word archetype. Uh, first of all, I'm not quite thinking about literary archetypes. Literary archetypes are the classic villain, the classic miser. What do we call him? Scrooge. Okay, that's an archetype. The classic hero, white hat, white horse. The classic damsel in distress. The classic reluctant hero, we call him Bilbo. You know, they, they, right? These are literary archetypes. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? And I'm not talking about prototypes. A prototype is the first one in a sequence. So a car manufacturer will make a prototype, and then they'll make sure the, uh, the line is engineered so that others will come. Okay? So I'm not talking about that. Okay, I'm going to suggest that everything in Genesis 2 regarding human origins, regarding human origins, is first and foremost archetypal. Not just a prototype, 
but something that involves embodiment. A prototype doesn't involve embodiment. But when the New Testament talks about the way that we all sin in Adam, Adam's a prototype. Through Adam comes death. I'm sorry, an archetype. <laughs> now I'm mixing you up. Okay? Through, from Adam comes death. From Jesus comes life. They're both archetypes. There's an embodiment involved here. Okay, so it's a certain type of representation. So I'm suggesting that the forming accounts, that's rib and durst, dust, we'll talk about them, are most relevant to Adam and Eve as archetypes rather than as individuals. Now I'll, I'll try to emphasize, emphasize this a couple times, so hear me say this. I do believe Adam and Eve are real people in a real past, individuals who existed. But individuals who really existed can be used as archetypes. That's a literary kind of use. Paul uses Adam as an archetype. That's fine. Adam existed, but he has archetypal value. So I want to know in what aspects Adam is an archetype and in what aspects Adam is a, an individual. When it says that Adam knew his wife Eve and they bore a son Cain, that's individual. That's not an archetype. So some things in this narrative are individual. When it puts Adam at the front of a genealogy, that's individual. Okay? But other things may be archetypal. How would we know? How can we tell? It's identified as archetypal if it refers to everyone, not just to those individuals. Anything that we see here in these texts that we say, well, that's, that's everybody. That's true of everybody. That would be archetypal. Okay? We, we all didn't get involved in bearing Cain. That's individual. So that's how we're going to proceed methodologically. So let's get started. First of all, the word formed, some people say, well, that sounds very material. You've been talking about, you know, material, functional. Now, formed sounds really material. You're right, it sounds material, but it's not used material. Events planned long ago, same verb. Heart formed, there it's not talking about uh, your blood pump. It's talking about the thoughts of the heart. Days ordained by God, all using the same verb. In fact, when Zechariah 12.1 talks about God making the heavens and the earth and forming the spirit within people. Same verb, not material. Now usually when we think of Adam being formed from dust, one of the things that people will mention is chemistry. They might even say stardust, but of course, Israelites don't know anything about stardust. And of course, in fact, they don't know anything about chemistry. The silicon factor or you know, the ways in which we share certain chemical properties with dust, nah, that's, that's not in the Hebrew mindset. Their periodic table is very small. So they're not thinking chemistry. Uh, more frequently, you'll find people talk about craftsmanship. You know, God getting down and dirty, getting his hands involved. This is a hands-on process. God's doing this. And, and so there's craftsmanship here as God crafts the human body. Well, that, that would be good, except that it says dust, not clay. If craftsmanship were the idea, it would talk about clay. You can't form dust. It would use clay. You say, well, God could do it. Well, God, you know, that's not the issue here. <laughs> okay? If it wants to convey God forming through craftsmanship, it would use clay. And lots of ancient Near Eastern texts do. Matter of fact, most ancient Near Eastern texts that talk about the creation of humanity focus on some material. Sometimes it's clay, sometimes it's the blood of a god, sometimes it's spit, sometimes it's tears of the god. They all focus on some material, but focus on that material is not a question of material. 
It's a question of identity. What is a human being? We would expect the same with regard to dust here. So what is the significance of dust? We look to the text to tell us, and it does. If it's not chemistry or craftsmanship, we look in the text and find out that dust equals mortality. Genesis 3.19, dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Identity, just like all the other ancient Near Eastern texts, the ingredient does not really have to do with material, it has to do with identity. What are you? What am I? We are dust. We are mortal. We are frail. You say, wait a minute, hold it. Red flag just popped up. I saw them all over. Mortal? God created us immortal. Paul says so. Let's look at Paul again. Romans 5. Paul affirms that we are subject to death because of sin. And some people infer that that means that God created us immortal and that before sin there was no such thing as death. But that's not what Paul says. He says we are subject to death because of sin. What else could that mean? Well, let's take a look at Genesis again, Genesis 2, and we find something very unusual. God says he creates people out of dust, and he indicates this connection between dust and mortality. But then we find something else really interesting. God makes this garden for people, and he has two special trees in there. One is a tree of wisdom, knowledge of good and evil, and one is a tree of life. Immortal people don't need a tree of life. If people were created immortal, there'd be no need for a tree of life. But people made of dust, frail and mortal, for them, a tree of life is an antidote. It's a remedy. It's a possible solution to their plight. And remember that when God drives them out of the garden, he places the mighty and fierce cherub to guard the way to the tree of life. You do know that that cherub is not the pudgy little angel baby like in Valentine's Day cards, okay? Bad process of language there, okay? The cherub are mighty, fearsome, guardian, hybrid creatures that guarded sacred space and thrones in the ancient world to protect the tree of life. And therefore, since Adam and Eve had no access to the tree of life because of sin, they are subject to death. Paul. See, now I'm appalled. So Paul isn't saying people were made immortal. He's identifying the fact that we have become subject to death, which is what we were created mortal to be, but we're subject to death because of sin, because otherwise we would have access to a tree of life, and we wouldn't be subject to death. Subject to death, not subject to death, would not mean immortal. It would mean that there was a remedy. And of course... Paul is going to talk about how Christ is the replacement remedy for us. Christ as a tree of life, bringing life to us. So this doesn't disagree with Paul. Now, next big step here. Look at this psalm, this remarkable psalm. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Dust and formed. We know he's dealing with Genesis 2 here. Same terminology. But look at that remarkable little pronoun there. We. We are formed from dust. 
every human being is formed from dust. The Bible says so. In fact, Paul says so too. The first man is of dust and all are from dust. Dust is what we are, but it is not who we are. Because God makes us more than what we came from. God made the Israelites more than what they came from. Your father was an Amorite, your mother was a Hittite. I think Monty Python used hamster, never mind. Okay? That's what, what Israel was, that's what they came from, that was their ethnic stock. But God has made them more than what they came from. And I would argue for people who are comfortable with evolutionary theory, the point is the same. God has made us more than what we came from. Sometimes people worry about evolutionary theory because they said, this says that somehow I'm, you know, came from primates, although that's, that's an, yeah, that doesn't quite hit it. But, but of course, the, the answer, it's worse. You're dirt. <laughs> the fact is, no matter what you think we came from materially, God has made us more than what we came from. Being formed from dust does not describe material formation. I conclude that because all of us are formed from dust, and that does not describe our material formation. I assume that most of you were born from a mother nine months and kind of regular process? Anybody virgin born? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. I'm assuming that's the case. That's our material origin. Yet, we are formed from dust. Therefore, formed from dust does not describe material origin. Being formed from dust would not preclude being born of a woman. 300 examples right here. Being formed from dust would not preclude being born of a woman. Now, I know you're processing all this, so you haven't quite realized yet that I just answered the question about whether Adam had a belly button, but thank me later. Okay. This is not material origin that Genesis 2 is talking about. This is identity. It doesn't care about biology. It doesn't think in biological terms. It's not interested in the house story. It's not interested in materiality. Biological human origins is not the focus of the biblical text. It's got other more important things to do. It's intended to communicate what all humans are, not what Adam uniquely is. That's the archetype idea. Formed from dust describes us all. And the Bible says so. It's not trying to describe something unique about Adam. So, when Adam first is introduced to Eve, does he believe that she has been made from his rib? Now, see, you've all become reticent here. Since he asked that question, that probably means that the answer I would normally give without even thinking is probably, I'm just going to keep it to myself. I'm not going to shout it at him. <laughs> no, Adam did not think that. Come on, Doc, how can you say that so confidently? Well, the way I usually say things confidently, because the text tells me. How does the text tell you that? Read the first words of Adam. What are they? She is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
Could have just stopped with bone if this was all about a rib. But he doesn't. You know, you go into a restaurant, order a rack of ribs, you hate it when it's just bone. I mean, I just hate that. But we're not talking about a rack of ribs here. We're not talking about a single rib. We're not talking about a rack of ribs. We're talking about a side of beef. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So wait a minute, then what's this rib thing? Okay, now, you've learned the method that we've been talking about all morning. So let's take a look at how this word rib, the Hebrew word, is used other places and see what anatomy it refers to. Okay, let's take a look at every single one of them. Okay, we're done. This is the only one where it has any possible reference to anatomy. Well, what else can it mean? What else, how else is it used? I'm so glad you asked. Look at how much we're learning. It's typically an architectural term in which it refers to one side of a pair. You know, like we've got the doorway over there. Two, two doors. One, one side, the other side. Okay, sides of the auditorium, one side, the other side. Okay, you'll sing verse one, you'll sing verse... No, we're not singing, okay? So this idea of two sides, uh, the left side of the temple, the right side of the temple, the north side of the altar, the south side of the altar, when there's a pair. That means that this text is suggesting that Adam is <whistles> cracked in two. And one half used, presumably the better half, to make Eve. That, that's the, the thrust of the term. Now, you'll find that um, it's, yeah, you look through all the early interpretations when you're using Greek or Latin or Aramaic, um, the term they use to translate rib is a, um, it's ambiguous in general. That is, it can refer to a whole side rather than to a rib. So even in the early translations, it was using ambiguous language. Rabbis in the second and third century were arguing about this already. So this is, this is a known issue in the text. So they're all very ambiguous. Third, four, okay, forgot I had those. Okay, good. So, but if he's cut in half... That's fairly radical surgery. But why should we think it's surgery? Israelites aren't doing surgery. They don't even know about surgery. They're not thinking about an anesthesia, Adam in a deep sleep, okay? Count backwards from 10, you know? I mean, think ancient world. So what's going on with Adam in a deep sleep and one side of him? What's going on? Well, we have to look at the word. The Hebrew word, both in noun and verb forms, occurs about 15 times. And there are two specific sorts of contexts in which it occurs. Uh, the first is a context in which it refers to someone being oblivious to a dangerous situation. So when uh, Saul is, and his whole army is fast asleep so that David and his men can creep all the way to the center of the camp and there's a spear sitting right by Saul's head and it's so tempting, they're all in a deep sleep, oblivious to the danger that lurks. Jonah in the bottom of the ship. Okay, see, the seas are rough, the ship's tossing and turning. In fact, it's thinking about breaking up, even though breaking up is hard to do. And Jonah is asleep in the bottom of the ship, just oblivious to the pending danger. Sisera, the Canaanite general fighting Deborah and Barak, flees in the battle, goes to the tent of one that he believes is an ally. And uh, Jael, her husband, Hever, and, and she welcomes him in. She gives him a warm cup of milk. She covers him with a blanket. And then when he's fast asleep, danger is lurking. This is a woman with a hammer and a peg. And it's another temple story of sorts. <laughs> so that's one way. One way that the word can be used. Hopefully that's not the way here. 
lurking danger, woman on, <laughs> woman on the floor. Oh, no. Okay, so hopefully that's not the kind that's being used here. The other kind are texts in which it's not lurking danger in the physical world, it's rather revelation in the material world, a visionary state. Okay, and Abraham in Genesis 15 is, is the best passage. Abraham in a deep sleep, and God shows him a vision that is the ratification of the covenant. And of course, I would opt for that one in this case. That's a major way the word is used, and that's an important one. Um, it's true the text could be clearer. It doesn't use the word vision in Genesis 2. It could be clear, but again, the word's the word, and that's the kind of thing that it means. So I would then propose that Adam is in a deep sleep, not for surgical purposes, and not because of lurking danger, but because God has something important to show him. You see, he's been looking for a helpmate. He's looked among the animals. Helpmate there is not a reproductive partner, else he wouldn't be looking among the animals, just saying. And so here he's looking for a helpmate, and that involves someone who is his equal. And God shows him that woman is not just another one of the creatures. Woman is his equal. She's part of him. And therefore, she suits the, the, the role clearly. Okay, some other language stuff. Okay, so that's why the text tells us, that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. Because they're part of a whole. Biological relationships pale in comparison to this kind of relationship. And he's united to his wife and they become one flesh again. That's not talking about sex. That's talking about ontology, essence, nature, identity. You become one as you were. This doesn't suggest that every, every man and every woman has kind of this, has to find the one that hooks up to them, you know, like continental drift, you know, how do they fit together? You know, it's not that kind of suggestion. And it certainly doesn't suggest that if you aren't married or choose not to marry, that you're only half a person. None of that, that's individual. This is talking about species, who we are as humanity. Now, what is this task that they have? The task is a priestly task. How do I know that? The Bible tells me. What is the task that God has given Adam? In 2.15, it talks about it, serve and keep. But we read that, and we've made one mistake in thinking that leads us to another mistake here. We've made the mistake of thinking that the Garden of Eden is paradise that the Garden of Eden is beautiful green space, that the Garden of Eden is a perfect vacation spot. We've made certain assumptions about what the Garden of Eden conveys. But as I've tried to explain, in Genesis 1, God was setting up the cosmos as sacred space. Genesis 1 doesn't tell us where the center of cosmic space, that is the place of God's residence, is. It just says he's setting it up to be that. Chapter 2 tells you where the center of sacred space is, where God's presence is, and that's the Garden of Eden. Green space doesn't matter. Sacred space is what this is all about. This is temple stuff. And so they are, Adam is given the task in 2.15 to serve and preserve sacred space. This is not gardening. This is not digging and planting, irrigating. It may, insofar as priests sometimes worked in gardens associated with sacred space, there could be some of that, but that's not the main goal. The main role of the priest is to serve in sacred space. And this first word, avad, serve, can be used to till the ground, but most often in the Pentateuch it's used for priestly roles serving in sacred space, doing their priestly duties. And keep, preserve, is not a landscaping term. It is a priestly term. What priests are supposed to do is preserve the sanctity of sacred space. That's their job. 
We sometimes think that priests are just supposed to offer sacrifices. No, that's just one way that they can preserve the sanctity of sacred space. There are lots of other things involved. Priests are guardians of sacred space. The Garden of Eden is sacred space. Adam is put there as a priest to guard sacred space. Now again, that could suggest that there are other people outside the garden, or it could suggest other options. There are a variety of them. But priestly roles, so he needs a help meet. He needs somebody, an ally. That's really as close as we can get to what that word means, an ally. It doesn't suggest superiority or inferiority, simply an ally. And so he's looking for someone to help him with that task. It's not good for man to be alone. That doesn't mean that because he can't reproduce by himself, and it doesn't mean because the poor guy will be lonely. It means he's got a task to do, and he could use an ally. He looks among the animals. None of those are his equal. None of those have the identity. He names them. That gives them their identity, their roles and functions. And guarding sacred space is not among them. But then Eve is not just another creature. She's part of him, as he sees in this vision. And therefore, she is suitable to help in this sacred task. As priests, they are representatives of all humans. Whether you think they are humans at that time or just humans to come, they are representatives. This is not archetypal, though. There's no embodiment here. This is a priestly representative, which is different than an archetypal representative. Priestly representation differs because in a priestly representation, there is no embodiment going on. Yet, the priest's actions can have ramifications and implications for those that they represent. Think about priests in the terms of how Israel is a kingdom of priests, mediating knowledge of God and access to God's presence. Okay, so they have a priestly role, and that's where Eve comes into the picture. Okay, so let's try to start summing up here. I've got five minutes left. If the details of the forming apply to the archetypes, we then have no information about the formation of them as biological individuals. Again, the conclusion I'm reaching is the Bible's not making a claim about material, biological, human origins. It's making some extremely important claims, but not about that. Archetypal identity does not negate the existence of the individual. I said that before, I'm reiterating. They are individuals, but more importantly here, they are being used as archetypes. So the appropriate question is not, is this really what happened? But rather, is this what people really are? Identity is the issue. We have the message of Genesis archetypes, created with human body, mortal bodies, provisioned by God, given a role of serving in sacred space, divided into male and female. These are all the important issues about human identity that the text is making claims about. So, how do we think about material origins? If Genesis 2 has an archetypal focus, there is no biblical account of material human origins. God made us all, no matter what process he used. He made you and me through the process of nine months in our mother's womb. He makes all of us. It's always an act of God. It doesn't mean that common descent is true, only that it would not contradict the biblical record. If someone is convinced of common descent, the Bible's not going to be a problem for that. Again, you've got to explore the science, and I'm not a scientist. You've got to explore the science to decide what science is credible. But you can't say the Bible cuts off that conversation. Special, direct, creative work of God is found minimally at the functional level. Of course, God is involved in everything, so it doesn't make much sense to say just these things, but these are things that God does that really couldn't be described by biological or material functions, but they're things that God 
is involved with. God's involved with everything, even if you do have natural explanations. When the text says it was good, I'm going to skip this slide, because we did talk about this a little bit, that, yeah, okay. Um, so, <laughs> running out of time, got to make choices. So, uh, order, non-order, and disorder. Order is what creation does. Non-order is what preceded, that is before it was ordered, like the unpacked boxes in your apartment. Okay? So there's non-order, then God brings order, but then sin brings disorder. Non-order is not evil. Disorder is evil. So we live in a world of three. We live in a world where there is still non-order, which will be resolved eventually in new creation, in which there is order because God has set up order and has recruited us to help in the order-bringing process. And there is disorder because sin happened and it has its results. So we live in a world of three. So order is connected to sacred space. There was still non-order that remained after creation. That is, there was still the sea. The sea is non-order. And it was there still. And it's not until you get to Revelation 21 that it says, and there was no sea where all non-order is resolved. People are given a task of expanding sacred space and order, subduing and ruling. The presence of God brought life. And if he invests that in a tree, that's his business. But life doesn't come through a fruit. Life comes from God. And if he sets it up through a tree, fine. The serpent is a chaos creature, promoting disorder, representing non-order. We can't jump to Satan. That only comes out in the New Testament. Old Testament never knows that the serpent is Satan. Never views the serpent in that way. People want it to be the center of order. That's the fall. It's not, I took a bite of fruit. That's the fall. It's not even, I disobeyed God. That's the fall. The serpent said, you can be like God. And they said, I want that. That's the fall. And so they ate the fruit and they disobeyed. People wanted to be the center of order. After all, when the serpent said you can be like God, he didn't mean you'll be omniscient or you'll be omnipotent. Knowledge of good and evil, wisdom, order. Sin brought disorder. And so they were cast from sacred space into a less ordered realm outside the garden. This is the story. Now, all of this is in Lost World of Adam and Eve, which just came out six weeks ago, and you can flip through one back at the table. Okay, so how should we think? First, it's important to recognize what the biblical claims are. Now, some of you might have been persuaded by the way I put things together. That's great. Some of you might not be. That's fine. We don't have to all agree. I suspect we don't all agree about eschatology. We probably don't all agree about denominations. We probably don't all agree about gender roles. There are things we can disagree on, but we can recognize that even the person on the other side of the aisle is trying to be a faithful Christian reading the Bible the best they can, even if they come to different conclusions. It's important for us to be engaged in understanding the Bible, but also to recognize other people might come to different conclusions, but if they are being faithful in their interpretation of Scripture, but that's okay. Let's sit together in the same pew. Let's sing the same hymns. Let's pray together. It's not an us-them. Acceptance, then, of those who choose differently. As long as faithful interpretation is going on, Again, you may not be persuaded by the way I frame the position, but I hope that you saw very clearly that I'm trying to be faithful to God's word. Now, you may not feel inclined to adopt the position that I've suggested, but maybe you're not struggling with these issues. Um, maybe, though, someone that you love is. You going to have anything to give them? And your kids or grandkids... Friends are persuaded by some of the science and feel like this means that they have to somehow get rid of their faith. You going to have an alternative to give them? I hope so. 
even if it's not one that, sh that you prefer. Acceptance of science does not require rejection of the Bible or faith. What's most important from a biblical theological standpoint is that we know in our deepest part of our hearts that God has made us more than what we came from. Whether you think that's stardust or dust or primates through common descent, that God has made us more than what we came from. And that is a direct act of God. That's the core biblical position. So this is important for us in ministry because we've got people of all different persuasions on this. And if we're only ministering to the people who agree with us instead of a wider swath of people who are trying to do their best with the Bible, uh, we're limiting ourselves too much. It's important for evangelism. There are people out there that are very intrigued by Christianity, but they get hung up because they say, I've kind of accepted the scientific consensus and that means Christianity is closed to me, they think. That means I can't believe the Bible. That means that I can't come to faith. We need to tell them there's another story. That those, those positions that they've adopted do not keep them from the kingdom. And we need to be aware of it because of attrition. How do we deal with the hemorrhaging that takes place from our churches? As our young people are confronted with the claims of science and find them persuasive if we've told them all along that to accept science means to reject God, and they've believed that, then when they see science that's persuasive, they decide they have to jettison the faith. There's no need for that. So let's see what we can do to stem the attrition that takes place. Basically, I want to say to you that the war is over if you want it. How much do we want it? Thank you. Uh, good. We're going to have um, some time uh, here now for uh, some questions, uh, primarily from the audience. And so I'm going to uh, give this, or Joel, you're going to walk around. Okay. So we're going to just uh, put the table out here and have a seat. Um, and then, oh, we've got questions already. Um, and then we'll have, uh, uh, Joel will come around uh, with the microphone and take questions uh, from the audience. Uh, the, the first question I would like to um, pose, uh, and that is, uh, John, if, I don't know if you're concentrating on the no, table or the questions now, but no, um, first question I would like uh, to pose is um, the question uh, of relating the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament written, of course, deeply in the context of what we're calling the ancient Near East. And um, I'm wondering if uh, the, the Bible as a whole, sort of seeing the Bible as a whole as authoritative, if that complicates mm -hmm. matters in that the New Testament was not written in that same, with, with that same cosmology. So, so how, do you, how do you address yeah. those sorts of concerns? No, it's an important question. And of course, there are some significant changes in that cultural river that take place between Old and New Testament. By the time you get to New Testament, Hellenism has swept through uh, and Hellenistic thinking, and this brings all of things like Plato and Aristotle and um, new ways of thinking about the world, new ways to penetrate a material understanding of the world, a new interest. Uh, you've got the Gnostics who said the material was nothing and didn't matter, and uh, so all kinds of controversies that now begin to focus on the material aspects. That makes it a lot different world than the Old Testament ancient Near East. Uh, at the same time, uh, you can still see evidences that the function and order issues were very important for them. Uh, Colossians talks about Jesus as the creator and all things visible and invisible. You know, they're not stuck on the material yet, but they're moving in that direction, but it's a, it's a slow process. 
So we're interested in what the New Testament has to say about it, but that's also going to reflect the questions they have. The New Testament largely isn't going back to give you an exegetical textual analysis of Genesis. It's rather saying, how are they reading some of Genesis and the rest of the Bible in relation to the questions on the table for them? We all tend to read the Bible in light of the questions that are on the table before us. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to expect that sometimes it's not going to pan out. So uh, that there might be a little more interest in the material in the New Testament is fine. After all, we do believe that God created all things visible and invisible. We, we believe that. Uh, it's just that there's more interest in it in the New Testament. I don't see the New Testament overriding any of this. Uh, again, even by New Testament times, the ancient world, the ancient Near East, is largely unavailable to them. Hellenism has been very efficient. Yeah. Is our mic working? I might have to surrender mine. I can speak Here, let's, let's have the, you talk. The switch about. should. Um, I'll go ahead. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I really believe that this kind of research and your insights, along with you know the work of other scholars, is key to overcoming and ultimately destroying mm -hmm. the um, myth of the conflict of science and religion. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, first, my, my question, I found it fascinating. I haven't yet read your book on Adam and Eve. I do have it, but um, the uh, question, you, you know, this idea that they weren't tending the garden, they weren't actually working the soil and doing all those things, uh, raised a question in my mind about our classic understanding of what dominion means. We tend to think of it, you know, especially in ecological terms now, you know, caring for the earth as a material <laughs> thing. So what does dominion mean mm -hmm. in the context of this uh, priestly role? Right. Uh, it means expanding sacred space. Um, that is, the subduing is subduing it to order. Not order just focused on us, order focused on sacred space. So the dominion is not um, anthropocentric, focused on people and their best use. It's not biocentric or ecocentric just for its own sake. It's theocentric. That is because this is sacred space and we are engaged in expanding order as God would have it. We're vice regents. So it does have an impact on that. We got a guy over there. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. It's on. It's on. Okay. Um, I've got just a clarification. I want to make sure I understood it correctly, and then two quick questions. So in your thesis, what you're saying is that Genesis 1 does not then really talk about creation ex nihilo, nor does it talk about the actual creation of time. It talks about the concept but not the creation. So then you can't really say that time was created in day one or day four when the sun and moon there. If I understood it correctly, it neither talks about this nor this. Correct, it's not ex nihilo because that's material. That's a material question. Again, both the Israelites and I would agree that when God did the house story, he created out of nothing. Okay, but that's not this story. That's not Genesis 1. And time, yes, I'm not saying that time began. This is talking about how it's setting up for us. Again, time working in general is house story. This is talking about, okay, now how's this home working for you? So it's like the realtor is going through and saying, and here's the switch for the thermostat to make this work for you. Okay, and here's where you turn the water on and off. Okay, so it's not that those things didn't exist till then. It's that now they're becoming part of our home story. And in that case, if it's not specifically talking about creation of time, the debate about how to interpret day becomes irrelevant at that point, right. correct? Uh, it, it not only becomes irrelevant, although again, I think the Israelites would have understood a day, evening and morning. Because mm -hmm. um, again, we're not talking physics here. Okay, so they're talking about how their world works. And God set it up to work this way. 
Okay. The two questions I have, so in terms of the, the Adam and Eve, that they're an archetype, how do you reconcile that with Romans 5.12, you know, the, through one man sent entered? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. The second one is the creation out of dust and how some of the, the patristics, and in the modern day, talk about the um, miracle of Jesus with a blind man where he took out of the mud, spat on it, and created as the Logos created in the beginning out of that, it was a, it was a verbatim act of creation, similar to what he did. Okay, remind me of the first one again now. Um, the uh, 512, <laughs> Romans, yeah, 512. through, through, okay. one, uh, yeah. you know, through yeah. one man sin entered. Okay. Um, again, I've tried to indicate that the forming accounts are archetypal. The entrance of sin is not archetypal in my understanding. The entrance of sin is individual because that is something they did that we didn't do. So they're not embodiments there, they are acting as individuals. And so sin, in my view, came in one point of time, one man. Okay? And now the second question was? I'm, John, 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 okay. So the use of, of uh, dust and then, uh, again, I don't see that he's commenting on Genesis 2 at that point. He's using the same ingredients, but I don't see that he's making the same point by it. So I haven't looked at it in that way. Oh, wow. Yay. Lots of questions. Oh, this is a guy who so, wants to know about polymers um, in his laptop. <laughs> More on the, uh, the seven days thing that was mentioned in the last question. So um, one thing that I've run into with different interpretations of Genesis 1 before is that there does seem to be this um, heavy emphasis on the seven days. So if it's not the um, material world that's being created in seven days, but it is the making house, the house a home in a sense, um, what do you do with the things like um, constellations or like, um, like plants, those sorts of things that seem to have very major um, physical significance, like you wouldn't have disordered stars at a point in time and then the stars become ordered to um, be useful to people. Does that, do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, again, non-order um, is only representing non-order with regard to human function, functioning. Mm -hmm. what, how do humans use constellations? Well, they, they use it for a timekeeping because they understood, they understood seasons. So they observed the stars and the movements of the constellations, mm -hmm. and they became the premise for order keeping for humans. It doesn't talk about whether they're in that formation or not, but God's the one who made them in that formation, of course, because mm -hmm. God made everything. So would that part of the account be um, God teaching people how to use that? Would, like, what, what significance does it have that God is setting that the constellations, for example, in order in one of those days. He's establishing those things as having functional and order significance for the people living in the home. Okay. Again, back to the realtor taking you through the house and telling you how it all works. Okay. Um, you say that Adam and Eve as archetypes don't necessarily represent the male and female humans that God created in chapter 1. Uh, I didn't say they didn't represent them. Or, or weren't the exact same people? Not necessarily. Again, Adam and Eve could be among them. Uh, Adam and Eve could be the only people in chapter 1, or they could be among a larger group, or they could come later. Three options. Okay. So one of those options that Adam and Eve came from a larger group, mm -hmm. when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, would that have been creating his spirit? And so the humans before Adam might have been spiritless animals? I wouldn't see it that way because even animals in the Bible have the breath of life. So that's not a soul. That's not the thing that's the spiritual being. And therefore, no, I wouldn't see that as taking place there. Uh, all creatures have the breath of life. And that doesn't mean they all have souls. Sorry about your dog. Thank you, Dr. Walton. I, the question I have, there, there seems to be a widespread misinterpretation of what science really is. And having been a scientist for 35 years, I know it's basically a very imperfect tool 
and an imperfect subset of philosophy in general. And even science itself will prove that there are questions we can never answer with science. And so I, I guess the question is, why do we consider science able to even address questions of this nature? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's because in our world today, for good or ill, we often assume that science gives facts. And what you've just said, of course, says the other view that no, it, it doesn't. And most people who know their way around science recognize that. But that's how the general population often acts, that the science is giving us facts. Um, but even without that view, still we understand that science provides models. And if those models are premised on certain ideas or give certain conclusions that people perceive as being in contradiction to the mm -hmm. Bible, then, of course, they start to have difficulties. With and them. all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Yeah. All generalizations are misleading, including that one. <laughs> Good morning. I, my question is referring to the fact that um, you said that the, the concept that Adam may not have been the very first, but there may have been a group of people. How do we, how would you reconcile that with 1 Corinthians 15.45, when it says, Adam, the first man. Mm -hmm. Well, it also calls Christ the last man. And that doesn't mean he was chronologically last or that biologically last. It just means that he's the culmination, and Adam was the initiation. And so it places Adam in a particular role that's of significance. And I don't disagree with that in the least. Uh, but again, neither of them are identified for their biological placement. Um, following up on the discussion regarding how sin entered the world, let's suppose like you um, are allowing for that common descent is true and then uh, Adam and Eve were not the first uh, literal humans. How would you say that, could you explore that a little further? How would that then apply to the other humans living at that time or their descendants? And then, uh, you know, iteratively then to us. Um, it, of course, it's a very interesting question, and it's one on which we can only speculate. Uh, the Bible never tells us how sin uh, actually, it says it does impact the world, but it doesn't say how that happened, the mechanism. Adam and Eve sinned, and so everything shot. Well, what, what did that look like? How did that work? We don't, we don't know. Likewise, it never tells us how that's passed. It tells us sin is passed, but it doesn't tell us how it's passed, how we all inherit that sin. So the Bible is short on details on that particular issue. As a result, every traditional view that exists out there is our best guess. And that's whether it's Augustine or whether it's Calvin or whether it's uh, Irenaeus or whoever it might be, the traditions of the church on all of that are basically best guess. Um, and uh, you, know, you can't look to science to give you an answer to that. Science can't tell you how sin came in and how it spreads. Okay, so you can only look to the text, and if the text doesn't tell you, then you, you make your best guesses. Now, the way we usually think about it today is somehow connected to biology or genetics, even though Augustine didn't know anything about biology or genetics, and even Darwin didn't know genetics. Okay, so, but yet we often seem to think that sin is passed on somehow biologically. Now, that's a huge assumption. It's certainly one of the options on the table, but it's not something that the, the Bible nails down. Well, what are the alternatives? Well, another alternative is the, um, the damaging the environment, moral environment kind of idea. That is that when Adam and Eve sinned, it's like when that guy made a, whoever it was, did something wrong at Chernobyl. One person does it and boom, everything around is affected. And everybody living there is suddenly affected, and everybody born into it is affected, that it affects the environment. One company pollutes the, the air, and everybody in that environment now suffers for it. So there are models that go more in that direction. But again, they're only models, and what did we just learn about models? Yeah. So, so, uh, but that's, that's really the only way we have to go about it. Now, there's one other aspect to that, and that is, well, if Adam and Eve are only a couple among a whole population, 
So how did it get to them? Again, the environmental model is, is one way. But remember also that Paul makes the point right there in Romans 5. You know, we always look at 12, verse 12. But verse 13 says, without the law, there is no sin. Huh. Okay, so that means really the issue of sin is also an issue of accountability. Your dog can't sin. I, I know I seem to know a lot about your dog, but, um, and some of, some of you would beg to differ. Okay, but your dog can't sin because he's not accountable for sin. Okay, and so we talk about uh, age of accountability. You know, to figure out when uh, a baby's selfishness is just being a baby or when it's being sin. And these are questions, again, that we can work hard to try to, to address, but the Bible really doesn't lay that out for us. And so with, when you're talking about a, um, a large population alongside of Adam and Eve, you'd have to talk about it not in terms of just behavior we might call, we might call sinful, but rather at what point are they being held accountable? And if you have Adam and Eve among a whole population, and Adam and Eve blow it, Okay, and they're priests, that affects everybody, now they're all accountable. And what they did the day before and weren't accountable could be the same thing as they did the day after, and they are accountable, and now they're subject to sin and death. So, but again, these are models. You know. who, who, in your opinion, provides the strongest critique of the position you just put forward, or perhaps the strongest alternative? Well, of course, tradition is filled with alternatives. Um, modern discussions are full of alternatives. Um, there are um, maybe half a dozen uh, respected academics who have published critiques of my material. Um, I respect what they have to say. I recognize that they've arrived at a difference of opinion. Um, but in most cases, I feel like they've misrepresented or misunderstood my position. So it's hard to call them you know, strong, persuasive critiques because I think that I've been misrepresented and misunderstood. For the most part, they have trouble understanding what I mean about non-functional. And I've tried to explain that a couple different ways this morning, but still, it's hard to get your brain around and it's often misunderstood. So, uh, that's great. Uh, uh, so, following what you just said, First of all, thank you very much for what you're doing. I think it's really important to have another voice like yours. Uh, I've got my 14-year-old boy with me, and, and it's great to have this perspective. Uh, um, you know, I read both uh, The Lost World of Genesis and Adam and Eve, and, and I thought these were great. I do have some questions that actually relate to what we just said. Um, uh, Bill Craig uh, was part one particular person that, that criticized what you said, uh, specifically with regards to the perhaps dichotomy that you establish between material causation and final causation. In other words, you're not creating ex nihilo, therefore you assign function, but you uh, create a table out of pre-existing wood, you're rearranging things, you, you're reorganizing the molecules of the table, and in, in a way you're doing a lot of work. Uh, and to uh, follow on your analogy of establishing your home, uh, we're about to move out of our house. This is a lot of work. I mean, you're going to open the boxes and, and put your shelves and so on. So. You may have addressed this in your book, and I can't remember exactly, but what would an observer during that seven-day creation period, if somebody was standing there, what would they see? Would they see nothing at all? Just, you know, this is what we're going to, um, the function we're going to assign to the days and nights? Or would they actually see some, some stuff happening, I guess, would be my question. Yeah. The question of what we would see is a modern question. Now, what would the videotape look like? You know, that, that's a modern question, and it pushes things into the material realm because we see what's material. When the Bible talks about God's work in history for the Israelites, typically when it talks about what he does, you can't see that he is doing it. You have to believe that he is doing it. And you might see things happening because God is acting. But it's just the wrong question to say, what would we see? Um, what is the identity that is being promoted what is the concept that's being laid out? That's what the text is more interested in. There's no doubt about it that the functions that are discussed involve material objects. But my question is, is it an origins account which talks about the manufacture of the objects? 
And it's my point that no, it, it doesn't. It never does. Okay, and therefore it's not a material account. Certainly for something to function, there must be a something. Okay, so yes, it assumes that there are material things there. But is this the manufacture of the material object for the first time? Or is it identifying the function that will unfold? Again, not all the functions involve materiality, so, but some of them do. These are the functions they will have. And that's the distinction that I'm trying to draw. And Bill Craig did not understand that. And we've had conversations about it. And I think he understands it better now than he did, but I don't know. Uh, Bill was trying to line things up in Aristotelian terms. And I think he made the mistake of thinking that when I say ancient world, that that includes Aristotelian. It doesn't. Aristotle's classical world and not reflecting the ancient Near East at all. So I think there are numerous points on which there is just some disconnect here. Um, I don't have any trouble with ex nihilo creation. I just don't think Genesis 1 is that story. Okay, so it's, it's those kinds of, of issues. And um, I respect Bill, um, but you know, he, in his critique, I don't think he was seeing what, what, we, what I was doing. Yeah, I really liked what you had to say about rest and the idea of Eden being God's kind of command center initially. Um, I assume that means as we move on to Israel, that would mean God's command center is seen as in the temple of mm -hmm. Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which we see the fire descend. And then the second temple is built. We don't see the fire descend and it's silent. And the next time we see any sort of spirit of God descending, it's on his actual people in the day of Pentecost. Who become his temple. Which was my question. So could you maybe kind of expand on that a little bit and kind of how you see the people becoming the temple of God and what that means for being the command center, I guess, if we're going to use that language still? Sure. And, and this will have to be our last question. Ah, so I'll, I'll speak to this during the whole lunch period. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, this does talk about what to me is the big picture of the Bible. Sacred space, God's presence among his people, and his relationship with his people. That's what the Bible's all about. And so sacred space from the very opening chapter of Genesis down to the very last chapter of Revelation, God's progress in sacred space. He set this cosmos up to be sacred space. He inhabited it with his people. People sin and he drives them out of the garden. Sacred space is lost. That's the problem of the fall. They lost sacred space. They lost access to the presence of God and therefore the relationship with God that they had. The rest of the Bible is trying to get it back again. The covenant is a means to start to get it back again because the covenant is relationship, God with his people, in which he eventually takes up his residence again on earth in their midst, the tabernacle. And the tabernacle and temple are God's presence among his people. But we can see that the, the relationship's kind of rocky. They keep breaking the law. God's presence eventually is jeopardized. Ezekiel sees it leaving. Okay, But yet, it's already then talked about Emmanuel. God with us. An incarnation is a quantum leap forward in God's presence and relationship. That is, now the, the word became flesh and dwells among us. That's the sacred space presence relationship idea. Dwells among us and we beheld his glory as sacred space is supposed to do. Then Jesus says, I'm leaving. We talked about that, John 14, upper room. But I'm going to send the comforter. New quantum leap in sacred space. And so God's presence comes down, inhabits his people in the flame of the Holy Spirit. And we become sacred space. And we have relationship with God because of the work of Christ. And we are preservers of sacred space. We are a royal priesthood. And so the church is the temple. It's not geographical sacred space. It's anthropological sacred space. Christ in us. But even that's not the last step because new creation's coming when all non-order is going to be resolved, all disorder is going to be resolved, and there will be no temple. Because temple marks the, the concentric circles of diminishing sacred space. It marks a center. In new creation, it's all center. And there is no temple, and God will dwell among us. This is the story of the Bible. And if we miss it in Genesis 1, we've already, we're already behind. And that's the picture that I'm trying to give you of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. 
and the covenant and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and new creation. It's all a piece. We need to eat. So, well, I was wondering <laughs> if, if we could uh, rebook your plane ticket for tomorrow <laughs> afternoon so you could stick around tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, that was, um, was a wonderful note to close on. Um, uh, we have been thanking uh, Dr. Walton, uh, and we will continue to do so, but I want to uh, just take a moment to thank uh, the good people from Constance who are helping to make this event happen, um, people that are helping with food and setup and uh, planning that has gone into this event for uh, a very long time, and, and we're all benefiting from their labors, uh, who, which are God's labors, right? We're learning about how these things work together. Um, so let's give them a round of applause before we break.